number one, I'm going to tell you that, uh, you know, I haven't done as much speaking, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. We've been focused on growing our business and different things. So I'll probably fumble over a few words. I'll probably make some words up. But we're going to have a good time. And hopefully for those of you guys that uh, have invested uh, something very, very precious, and I'm going to treat it that way, which is your time. And so I'm going to do my very best <clears throat> to leave you with a couple things that, independent of what you're pursuing professionally, uh, can add value to you. Uh, because I, I think that you know, time away from whether it's your family, whether it's your studies, or other things, uh, we're going to treat that as a very important uh, and valuable asset. Uh, one of the things that I'll do, and, and we have some, some slides, and you know, we'll, we'll figure out if we're going to go over those or not, but, but we'll, we'll kind of play it by ear, is that we're going to talk about the macroeconomic environment and how to win independent of the doom and gloom. Right? Because all you have to do is really flip on any news channel, any business periodical. Right? And it's all about what's going wrong or what's not working. Right? It's all about how many people have lost their jobs this week, this day. It, it's about some of the chaos that's going on, quite frankly, with, with people in, you know, whether it be military establishments, whether it be personal homes, just doing things that just don't make rational sense. And so if you don't have a positive, optimistic outlook, it could be very easy to kind of fall into a woe is me kind of mentality, right? And one of the things that um, has been, if you will, ingrained in me since a very, at a very young age, and, and mentioned in the introduction, son of a football coach, is you got to figure out how to win independent of your environment. Because your environment is your environment. And it's the cards that you're dealt. And so you got to figure out how to roll with those cards and, and be successful uh, independently. So uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then we'll probably uh, ask a few questions and answer a few and, and go from there. But one of the things that, if we look at this picture, and illuminates, to me, that picture, that diagram, describes uniqueness. And that's what we're really all aspiring to demonstrate to others. What makes us special, right? Every day we're trying to figure out how to convey better what makes iCube special, what makes our small software company in Raleigh, North Carolina, located on Centennial Campus, roughly 35 to 40 folks that are servicing organizations like Raytheon, NASA, Adobe Systems. What makes us unique enough that those customers will entrust us with their technical assets? So that's from a personal and a, and a corporate level from our company. What does this slide mean to you as an individual if you're an undergrad or you're getting your master's degree? And you're trying to determine what makes you unique to that employer. In this stack of resumes that are emailed on a daily basis for one job opening, what makes you as an individual special? The challenging thing in, in terms of being in the job market today is so many of the resumes, so many of the interviews are kind of more of the same. And so we'll talk about some things that may give you some things to think about that can help you as you pursue some of the professional goals that you may have. A little bit about iCubed. Uh, established in 1984, um, Grant Willard, our founder, is NC State grad. And so you, we have a, I guess, a special place in our company for NC State, right? 70% um, of our full-time resources either were in our intern program or NC State grads. So even though I have light blue on, <laughs> I'm down with the wolf pack, right? Because <laughs> they're, they're producing some very, very talented folks. Um, engineering heritage and employee owned. Uh, one of the biggest things that occurred, and I've never seen this or heard about this in my career. In 2005, our company, part of our company was acquired by Adobe Systems. Grant Wood, our founder, went to work for Adobe and four or five of our engineers. So there was an interesting period within our organization because the leader of the organization, the founder of the organization, was moving on to a different space. And some of us had the opportunity to basically do an employee buyout of the existing, of the remaining business. Now, what Grant could have done, which would have been simpler, what he could have done, which would have been more immediately financially lucrative, is just sold the other piece of the company quick and easy and just been done with it. Instead, what he did was he provided 12 of us at the time, more now, the opportunity to work together as a team, which, which I liked, 
and see if we couldn't build upon what he started. So a small group of us basically took some emotional risk, not so much financial, but an emotional risk, and we started on this little journey for IQ being an employee-owned company. And what we found three and a half years into the program is we're now a debt-free corporation, except for some leasing things. Our CFO's sitting right here. This is Mark, so he's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Um, you know, except for some operating leases and different things. And what we've seen is a level of commitment within the organization that I would put up against any other organization on the planet. We absolutely, without a doubt, have an attitude and an expectation that winning every day is normal. That is our normal. And it has a lot to do with the opportunity that Grant provided to us. Our job was to make the most of it. In the last three and a half years, our business has gone in terms of people from about 17 to close to 40. Our revenue has almost doubled. In a down economy 2008, we paid record bonuses to our employee owners. 2009, we're on track to do something similar. So while many companies are taking a step back, we are continuing to take a step forward, and it's because each individual that walks through our doors has that sense of purpose that either they are an owner of the organization, number one, or number two, they can work hard enough to earn the right to be. And we've, we've seen pretty significant value add from that. We have some corporate partnerships. And one of the things that, that we have up there that is strategic to us is our relationship with NC State University. Right? We're just not quite big enough yet, can to be a super E. Right? But everybody needs a goal, right? <laughs> so we're, you know, we're climbing up that, that ladder. But we're glad to participate in the things that you all are doing because what we found is if we give and we're a good, if we're a good citizen to the NC State community, then that community will give back to us. And we've seen that in some of the relationships that we've developed, both with professors, both with Ken Tate's organization, and most importantly, with a lot of young people that have come through our doors. And they've either been interns and gravitated to full time, or they've gone on and done other things that are great, that we can help them continue to recruit and find the next superstars. In terms of creativity, yeah, this isn't so much a sales pitch for our, our, our products, but we've been able to, over the last 25 years, to reinvent ourselves and stay relevant. And so in, in under five minutes, I'll kind of give you a couple of little glimpses of that, and then we'll kind of get into the meat of what we're going to discuss. So our company started 25 years ago basically with a mainframe CADM simulation tool. It was basically a PC-based application that mimicked the features and functionality of a mainframe. The reason that corporations like this product is because mainframe seats and time on a mainframe are very expensive. So if you could create a similar environment, accelerate training time, it was something that was appealing. Grant didn't even have a company when people like Hughes Aerospace and General Dynamics wanted to pay real money for this product. Being the entrepreneur, he created one and took their money. <laughs> That's why I mean, hey, that was like awesome. Transition that, fast forward if you will, in the CAD engineering space, companies like Autodesk, companies like Parametric Technology, PTC, that have computer-aided design tools, if you will, we, we then found that we had a migration business where we were moving people and their digital assets from mainframe CADM to these PC-based design tools. So we wrote technology and services to move that information, basically data migration. Doesn't sound pretty, not particularly sexy, but the good thing about it is it paid bills, lots of them. Paid car payments, lots of them. Kept a small business of five to six people going, families fed. I don't know what you call success, but that sounded pretty good to me as we built the story. And then as these corporations started to move towards more PC-based design, people started using phrases like PDM, product data management. So they needed a way to warehouse all of this information, all these design assets. You know, I, some of this was before my time, but I, I, I listened to Grant and, and, and some of the stories that he would tell. People didn't really know what all these new words meant. But at the end of the day, people had design information that was scattered on hard drives all around an inner, uh, the organization, and somebody figured that was bad, right? That wasn't good, 
right? Because, you know, if Joe Bob or Jim or John Engineer decided that he wanted to hit the delete button, then two or three years of work disappeared. And Lord only knows if Jim Bob was not honest. Then he's walking out the door with all this information. So these companies decided that they wanted to consolidate the information, secure the access, and terms like PDM came about. iCubed being quick on their feet, quick on our feet. We created a little niche, basically moving information now, not from mainframe CADM to Autodesk or uh, PTC's products, but moving information into these data repositories, which me, I get in a little trouble sometimes with this, I just call them digital buckets. People that have ERP systems, PLM systems, and all these cool whiz bang names for stuff, workflows and access controls, when I break it down to a digital bucket, they're not necessarily a fan, but it makes sense, right? And so we helped put information in these digital buckets across the different design spaces. And phrases like product lifecycle management came about. Things like engineering business collaboration came about. Global product development. And as I fast forward what IQ began to do, and bringing you closer to where we are today, is we are focused on engineering business integration. And so we help people that need to collaborate on a global basis share their information and secure that information that they publish. We then expanded into the digital rights management business. Everybody, anybody here use iTunes? Familiar with iTunes? Let me give you a word picture, right? If you think of the iTunes UI, Right? It gives you a lot of options, right? You might like, who likes rap music? Right? Country music? Right? Uh, R&B. Right? So what iTunes gives you, you now watch this, this is important, is choice. Does that make sense? Steve Jobs, is that his name? Is that right? I'm sorry. <laughs> if y'all didn't think that's right, it did to me. <laughs> Who's that guy that did Apple? <laughs> sorry. I'm really that silly. Uh, so anyway, if you look on the left-hand side, it gives you choice. And what does a consumer really want, right? You don't want to be told what you want. You want the opportunity to package and pick those songs, those genres that are meaningful to you. Right? My wife, if she's going to ride on her uh, cycle bike in the morning or whatever, spin bike or wh whatever that thing I paid for that doesn't move, but it's going really fast, right? Spin bike. She has different tunes in it than my 13-year-old Mariah, right? Or than I do, right? Or than my son David. Right? I was like, David, do you want an iPod? He goes, what do I need that for? And I was like, well, you know, so you can listen to music. He's like, well, I just take yours. <laughs> he said, I don't need one of my, he said, what am I old for? I was like, eh, that's not really good. <laughs> so I guess you know who 50 Cent is, huh? <laughs> he was like, yeah, I like you. <laughs> you know? Now, how does this get back to engineering and what we do? We basically have a user interface that is similar to iTunes, Steve. It is not iTunes. But it's similar to iTunes that helps engineers make choices about the design information that they want to package. They then can package this information into a PDF file. Then they can share this PDF file because most people have Reader on their desktop. They can also put rights management permissions on this PDF file, just like iTunes does for music, such that we've taken something in a commercial space and we've applied those ideas and concepts to a business use, and that's one of the ways that we try to stay relevant and stay special. And so when people see our UI, they understand intuitively because we've given them a couple things. We've given them choice, we've given them security, and we've given them the portability to move their information around. And that's some of the creativity that we bring to our products. So, you know, why are we here tonight? Why, what, what am I going to share? We're going to talk about the characteristics, the capabilities, and the commitments uh, to be successful in this environment. You know, a couple years ago, I guess the stock market of the Dow was at, what, 6,000 at its low point, right? I mean, it's just catastrophe 
is just like an understatement, right? I mean, it just was ridiculous. And if you remember, it was kind of during the election, and it doesn't, to understand this point, it just doesn't matter what your politics are, right? All the different parties were like, well, this is what we should do. We should do a bailout. No, we shouldn't. We should do one, maybe. We should do one, no, -uh, that's dumb, but I vote for it. <laughs> At the end of the day, I remember sitting down with lunch saying, you know what, at least I know I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> that makes me strong. I mean, these guys actually stand up in front of the microphone like they had a game plan. But they're the same people that put us in the ditch. Is the economy stronger now or is it stronger then? I don't know. It's not an economics class because I wouldn't be teaching it. But the fact of the matter is strength is often an illusion. We thought the economy was strong, but the infrastructure was weak. You gotta be able to regroup and win an atmosphere of risk and uncertainty. And the last thing is something that I live by. Every day, all day. Every day is a race to improve, and every meeting you're in is a performance review. I believe that to my core. So therefore, I take no conversation for granted. I don't take a meeting with a customer for granted. I still have notes that I took listening to Grant mentor me on business from 10 years ago. I figured if he owned the company, it was successful, he took time to teach me, then I'll take time to learn what he's telling me. It was just, it was simple to me. It wasn't, it didn't make, the, it, it wasn't complicated, it made me better, faster, smarter than I could otherwise because I figured that every person I meet is my master in some way. It's attitudinal. I put my ego on the shelf and figure out how people can help me win. In another business life, everybody, anybody ever heard of uh, the ammo business? So years ago, so whether, you know, whether you're familiar with it or involved, Years ago, I was heavily involved in the Amway business. Here's the number one thing I learned. Build an organization, upwards of 200 folks, free vacations every single year. It was good to me. Some people were like, Amway? <laughs> I was like, hey, man, they're paying for me to go on these trips. I'm winning at it. And here's the thing that's critical, is it taught me how to lead people that didn't work for me. Interpersonal skills based on relationships, not based on whether or not I could fire you or not. However you learn those skills, I, I'm not here to, to describe that. What I'm telling you is, or recommending, is that somewhere in your educational curriculum, somewhere as you look at your improvement plan and your professional goals, you've got to figure out how to win and lead in small teams. You have to volunteer for it. There's plenty of problems at your job. Go sit down with your boss and figure out how to solve some and ask for a couple people to work on a team to get something done. What's the worst that could happen? You solve a tough problem, get promoted? You solve a tough problem when they're doing layoffs, they don't pick you? I mean, what's the bad thing that could happen for you doing something extra? I don't know. But I do know this. When I was working for Grant, and I worked for IQ for about 13 years, had several other jobs before that, but here's the reason I stayed. Because 13 years in a technology company is a lifetime, several lifetimes. Every three and a half years, like clockwork, my job radically changed. So I got a new job, new set of ambiguous responsibilities that he gave me. And it was refreshing. So here's, let's have some fun. Because I'm not going to talk to you all night. We're going to have a good time. Man in the red shirt, right there. Tell me your name again. Balaji. Balaji. See, I wanted you to say it first, but I got it. I remember it, but I didn't know if I could say Balaji correctly, but I got it. OK. What do you think my favorite alcohol beverage is? Do you think it's beer? Do you think it's wine? Do you think it's hard liquor? What do you, based on me talking, what do you, what do you think? what's my drink? Beer. beer? OK. Wrong, but OK. <laughs> All right, fidelity, right? 
All right. Scotch. Scotch. <laughs> awesome. Wrong. <laughs> what, what, is, what is it? Sweet tea. <laughs> 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 You're itching, you know, you're, okay, McKinsey. <laughs> That's all, almost good. What do you think of this? I'm going to go hard liquor. Hard liquor. All right, so this is helping me relax and fun with you guys. The answer is, Mark? Water. Water. <laughs> I don't drink. I remember getting stopped at, uh, I was, one night I was not driving correctly, according to a police officer. I disagreed with him, but you know, him, gun, light, backup car. Maybe uh, I was weaving a little bit. And so he rolls up on the car. Funny, this funny story after the lights were off. So he's like, uh, it comes to the car or whatever. So have you been drinking? And I was like, well, what would give you that idea? He was like, well, I've been following you for three, four miles, and you've been weaving, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I said, I can guarantee you one thing. I said, I might be a bad driver. I might be doing everything that you said, but I wasn't drinking. Test me. <laughs> and then he looked at me, and literally, 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 he starts laughing. He just, he goes, I don't even know if you're telling the truth, but you're convincing. <laughs> he said, I hear lies all day, every day. He said, but you actually, you know, he said, <laughs> he said, just never mind, straighten up. <laughs> I mean, literally, he just said, never mind, he said, just straighten up. Right? So they say, all right, so why don't I drink? Okay, and this isn't if you drink, I mean, I've, my buddies at iCube, we've gone, had a beer when I'm there, had a beer or two when I'm there. It's just a choice that I made, right? A couple of our business partners asked me, they'd known me for years, and they said, uh, Don, we've been doing deals for years, and we've never seen you dr drink anything. I mean, we've been drinking, and we've been pressuring you to drink, and you're just like, no, no, thank you, and you're always real cool about it, but Yo, man, we want to know. What is up, man? You Muslim? You this? I mean, they're asking me, not being Muslim wrong, like, man, what's your deal, right? Because they just were confused. I said, my dad told me not to. And they did just like y'all are doing. <laughs> they're like, who is that guy? Well, if you haven't met my dad, <laughs> I mean, he only had a couple rules, and I kept them rules. <laughs> He's a good size individual. But here's, here's my point, though. Here's my point. It comes back to mentorship. So that's an example of my dad. Let me give you something Grant asked me to do. When he, turned, when he turned over the company to our new fledgling team, right? he knew that there would be times where making easy decisions financially would be presented to us. And one of the things that he did that I respect, a lot of things I respect, but this very highly, is for the 13 and a half years that I worked for iCubed, and still do. I never had to worry about health insurance for me or my family. It was always company paid in good times and bad. All of the health care debate and different things, hey, phenomenal. What side of the issue are you on? Phenomenal. But for our 40 people, not an issue. Already handled. For the people that are full-time full employees for us. And, what he, and I remember him looking me in the eye, and he said, now, Donald, and he get, you know, I had all these rules and regulations and president and which guy to ask the board, and, and he said, whether it's on this sheet or not, I just want you to not touch that, that money and always continue to do that. It's just the right thing to do. And I'm not going to write it on this list. I want you to continue to do that because it's the right thing to do. Uh, okay. It's easy to say yes when you're not presented with a challenge. But in 2007, I told you the good thing. I told you in 2008, we paid a bunch of bonuses. 2009, we're going to pay some more bonuses. I didn't tell you about 2007, we're almost wrecked the bus. <laughs> kind of left that out of the story. Edit that off the tape. <laughs> 2007 was not my best year. <laughs> right? But that would have been the year under pressure, under financial duress, to alter a fundamental game plan. That would have been the time to blink. 
And I'm going to wrap this around to something that I think will help each of you. So I gave you an example of my dad. I gave you an example of my corporate dad. Let me give you a sports example. Right? I like racquetball. Okay? Started playing racquetball with some guys um, three, four years ago. And they were beating me and laughing about it. I mean, just enjoying the process. I, I, I gotta get this off my chest. This has nothing to do with technology, but it's just, just y'all need to know this and it's therapeutic for me. One guy beat me and called my dad. I mean, we come from a smack talking generation. <laughs> A lot of ex-football players, this guy's like six foot three. He said, hey, Coach Thompson. My dad was like, hey, yeah, what? He goes, your son is over here, and he is really struggling. He was like, what do you mean struggling? He said, I just beat him in racquetball, and he's throwing stuff, and he, he's just going to give up the game. Right? So fast forward. Now my game is better because I've been playing with guys that are sponsored players, get all their equipment free, registered with the different companies. I use their hand-me-down $350 rackets. Three and a half years later, the guy that was talking smack won't even play. He won't even return my phone calls. So what does racquetball, my dad, no drinking, grant and health insurance have to do with your life and how you pursue success? You have to find people that will tell you small things that will make a big difference not the many things that don't really matter. You have to find mentors in your professional life that will tell you those small things that make a big difference. And the critical component is you have to be a good enough student to get the trust level of a mentor so they'll actually share those small things with you. Because a lot of people that have critical knowledge that makes the big difference, they don't want to waste it on somebody that's not teachable. They, they would rather not kind of waste the breath, the oxygen. So I'll tell you another story real quick. 24-hour clock, working at the pantry. Had lots of jobs. You ever been into a pantry in North Carolina? They're based out at Sanford. You ever see the guy behind the counter in the red smock? That was me. And it's been 25 years ago, whatever, but why was I working at the pantry while I was in school in East Carolina while I was doing all this other stuff? It was the only place I could find that I could work overnight and only lose sleep. I could go to school during the day, and I could run my business during the midtime. How difficult was that? I don't know. When your buddies are coming in trying to buy alcohol and laughing at you, not the coolest place to be in your little red smock in the pantry. What does that mean to you? If you're late night at the computer lab, you're late night with three or four buddies working a project, and your friends are off doing whatever, and you're making that critical choice of how to spend your time, you need to stay firm with that. I want to encourage you, whatever your game plan is, it may be very different than mine. I want to encourage you that those are the moments that you are winning. Those are the commitments that you're making to your long-term future while other people are sleeping, while they're taking the weekend off. I had a young lady that works at her company. It's very cool. She said, she said, Don, can I talk to you? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, typically people say that a couple things. Like, I'm quitting. You, I mean, it's just normally not good, right? I mean, I, I'm a positive person, but hey, Don, got a minute? I was like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I got, you know, just a minute, right? And so anyway... We're, we're talking, and one of the questions was, and I hope you guys won't know her, so it, but the question she asked was, how do you rationalize the extra hours working and in school, time away from family when you're pursuing you know, advanced degrees, PhDs, different things like that, how do you stay encouraged? I mean, this was, her, this was the question. How do you stay encouraged to keep going? And then I said, well, just hold on. I got as much time as you need, right? And I just walked her through the process of what you're doing is what winners do. There's a book called Outliers that talked about Bill Gates. Everybody knows who Bill Gates is, right? Even Steve Jobs knows who Bill Gates is. 
what was impressive to me is the number of hours that he spent sneaking into a computer lab to get time on the mainframe. When I read that, I was like, that, that's right. Success, success is just simply predictable. Right, because there's a lot of people just as intellectually talented. A lot of people as physically gifted as Michael Jordan, but it's the price that people are paying. And it's kind of hard to want to pay that price in an environment that has just given you the bad news. And all I want to do is to encourage you to continue, whatever it is that your, your price is. Competencies. Technical, NC State's got that knocked out. I mean, we work with a lot of their students. I'm not in the classes, but we evaluate the students. We've got a lot of full time. NC State's got that knocked out. Technical competencies. The problem solving, the team building, and the interpersonal skills. As we deal with young people all across the country, I think there's a lot of room to grow in that area across the board. A lot of people that we work with technically, their entire career have been patted on the back for their technical prowess. If someone is a superstar athlete, they've been patted on the back for how fast they run, how hard they hit. But at every level of competition, it's the small little things that make a difference. In football, NC State, I mean, I watch football, football background, or Carolina, or what have you. It's not how fast. You have to kind of run a precise route. You have to actually know the plays in college. In high school, you just run by the guy, the quarterback throws it to you. I mean, seriously, I mean, it's a big difference. I mean, you're just like, hey, man, that guy, I'm faster than. I'm going to run it by him. You throw it. And I'm going to catch it. Hike, and we man, runs, they throw it, he catches it. Right? In college, they actually have them doing motion and all these different formations. And it's, so the guy from high school to college is like, man, I actually have to run fast go to school, I actually have to go to a class? Really? It's not what you said on the visit. <laughs> Did not tell me that. But anyway, it's different. What we found is that a lot of technologists, people in general, are excellent about solving skills solo. You give them a problem that's, that they are capable technically to handle on their own, and they'll grind it out. But really what that missing ingredient is, is those interpersonal skills to work together as a team, to challenge each other in a way that doesn't beat one another down, that progresses the team. And that's something that, whether there's a perfect class on it or not, you can create environments where you can get that on your own. One of the best things that occurs is when you teach somebody else something that you're good at. That's a form of teamwork. So if you're volunteering, if you're tutoring, if you're doing different things like that, you're transferring knowledge. You're figuring out a way to help somebody else be better. You're figuring out a way to put your ego on the shelf and help somebody else learn something that you've already acquired from a skill set standpoint. I also think that sales skills are pretty critical and missing in most people. And here's why. If you have a technically superior idea or concept, and my idea is technically inferior, okay? And there's just, it's factual. But I can present my idea in a more compelling way. I'm still going to beat you. Because most people want to buy, implement, talk about, describe something that's compelling to them, something that's packaged nicely. And what occurs is, and, and, and iCube just as well as anywhere else, is our guys will get frustrated that just their technical answer alone won't win the day. I can't believe this customer. I told them <laughs> to read the documentation. <laughs> Never mind the documentation's hard to get, outdated, the back end of the UI. <laughs> but the, it's the customer's challenge, right? The other thing in terms of sales skills is this, quite frankly. You need to promote yourself. And you go, well, I don't want to be a, I want to brag, right? Well, it's not quite that. The, let me use the best example that I could use of how you promote yourself, okay? You're available to solve problems that help your boss or manager look great. 
And you go, well, how does that help me? You're available to solve problems that help your boss or manager look great. But Don, how does that help me? If your boss or manager looks great and the company is downsizing, your boss or manager is protected. If your boss or manager is protected, they're going to want on the team the persons, the peoples, the employees that help them look great. It's job security and the success of others on your team or partners. One of the things in other roles within IQ that I made my job was to help our partner alliance managers, whether it be at Adobe, Parametric Technology, what have you. I wanted to see those guys promoted. So we'd work extra on projects for them, we'd do little things, and then over the last 10 years, a lot of the guys that I worked with and we worked with, right, are now senior vice presidents and directors of business development, and, and it's just awesome. Because you can pick up the phone now and they'll never say it. They'll never say we helped them get them promoted, right? They'll never say it, but they'll always take our phone call. And when they're in meetings about our $2 million project or our $1 million project, they'll remember the little company in Raleigh, North Carolina that had people working over the weekend, which Alan's team was doing, to make them look good. That sales skills in a, in a product development marketplace. It's going that extra mile. It's taking your eyes a little bit off yourself and getting the job done for people who, in the end, can make decisions that can make or break some of the career things that you're doing. It's putting your ego aside to do it. Characteristics. Teachable, we talked about that. Balanced ego, come back to that in a minute. Results-based, the key thing is emotional intelligence and emotional maturity, if you will. <clears throat> um, a lot of times, it's just hard to take tough feedback. I mean, has anybody struggled with that? I mean, is it just me? I mean, maybe it's just me. Anybody else? I mean, it's just hard, right? I mean, so why, I mean, think about it. If something's hard, then why would you just go ask for it? Does that make sense? Like, why would you go sit down with your manager or your peer and just say, hey, man, what am I not doing good? Smack me. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's hard, right? But to be, what I would encourage you to think about, all right, this is a little risky, it's on the video. If you had a little something in your nose, would you want somebody to tell you? If you had, I mean, if you had a little something in your nose, would you want somebody to tell you or just look at you like you were just goofy as all get out? Raise your hand if you want somebody to tell you. Right. If I have something wrong with my game at work, no, not you, Mickey, you're good. <laughs> you're straight. Am I, am I good? Am I good? <laughs> if there's something that is deficient in the talent arena, in the, in the characteristics that you're needing to succeed, wouldn't you want your peers to, not, not in front of 18 people, but wouldn't you want somebody to pull you aside and said, you know what, you need to think about this problem differently. To give you that guidance, here's what you have to do. Well, you don't have to. Here's what I recommend. My apologies. Here's what I recommend. You have to practice asking for critical feedback before you really, really need it, or you'll never do it in the crucial moments. I make it a habit of asking people, what can I do a little different? What can I do better? An absolute habit. And when people are strong enough care enough about me or our company to tell me it stings because a lot of times it's something I should have known better. I remember sitting with Mark one day. He said, I said, Mark, what, what can I work on? What can I do better? And he said, most things are good. This is good. He said, you're saying, you're trying to say I a little bit too much. I mean, we've got a team thing going here. I mean, it's not all about, you know, we've got a lot of people doing work. And he didn't say it like that because Mark's smoother than that. But it stung. I was like, why? I, I didn't mean it to come. I was thinking of all the good reasons he was wrong. I was like, but, but what happened? All right, man, thanks. <laughs> and, I, and I went off and I wrote it down, you know, and I started to work on it. I just started to work on it. 
I'll ask Alan, Director of Research and Development. I'll ask Tony, who works with our sales and marketing. And I'll ask Grant. Now, I don't really have to ask Grant. He just tells me. I don't ask my dad. He just tells me. <laughs> Somebody will do a mentors and friends. Wow, they just say, hey, man, this, you need to stop. Here's why. And go on. But others you have to pull from. And I would encourage you to develop the emotional strength to start asking people. Here's the scary part. Here's the scary version of this movie. The things that are holding you back professionally, other people know and would tell you if you asked. And since you don't know, then you've got blinders on walking in the middle of the street in your career. And that should be scary to you. So I just made a habit of asking. Some of it I agreed with, some of it I didn't. But at least I had the opportunity to make changes where I could. And it's been a big, big help. Commitments. You got to figure out how to be the type of individual resource that always delivers. Just no excuses. That, that always delivers, whether it's, it's a research project, whether it's a sales campaign, whether it's a, a technical project launch. And always delivering doesn't mean that there's no mistakes and it doesn't mean there's no deadlines that are missed or moved. A lot of times delivering means sitting down with your manager and letting them know when a project can't be done in a certain amount of time. Always delivering actually is just another way of describing truthfulness. Intellectual integrity. Have you guys ever been in meetings that people say yes but they mean no? That they agree to get out of a tough meeting or a tough conversation? How can, you, how can you succeed in a significant way if your team doesn't operate with a certain level of candor? It's one of the things at IQ that we fight for, quite frankly. Right? And it's very, very important. Another commitment, personal commitment. This might, uh, you know, the, the good thing is that I'm not running for office and I get paid. So hopefully keep your money's worth. And so I can tell you something that may ruffle a feather or two, and it'll just be OK. Right? So I'm going I'm to trust you guys a little bit, but I'm going I'm to ruffle a feather a little bit. <clears throat> in your schooling, in your professional career, as an academic administrator, whatever it is you do, there's another level you can take it to. You can do more. It'll require a little bit more work, a little smarter work, a little more collaboration, a little open to ideas. But if you're not searching for that more that you can deliver to your organization and your family, it's really, really tough out there. And one of the things that is special about where we work, and it's tough, is that we're pretty demanding that people get better every single day every single day. And one of our partners today is just, it's, this part, I mean, it's just sad. One of our large partners, major layoff today. A lot of, lot of great people looking for a you know, different thing to do. It's still occurring, it's still occurring. But the people that never leave the organization are the top producers. And so our goal as, an or, as a group here is to figure out in whatever arena you're in, how to become and stay a top producer. One of the things that is counterintuitive is being a top producer and sharing knowledge. A lot of times people think by being a top producer, you have to do those things alone. You have to be the special one. You have to be the one that stands out. A lot of times the most valuable people that an organization just can't live without are those that share and facilitate knowledge. And leaders in an organization know who they, who they are. It's the people that help everybody else in the team get a little bit better by their presence. An individual at IQ that has that kind of job security, he's not here today, he's a guy named Al Martel. Is that not right? Al has a significant level of deep domain expertise, but he's willing to share it with anybody who asks. Brand new young developer coming, Al, I'm working on this tough problem. He's a good sized individual. Right? Al's running, what, 6'3"-ish? <laughs> I don't want Al to see this tape get upset with me. <laughs> anyway, he's a good-sized individual, so if you don't really know Al, rolling up on Al asking a deep question might be 
Scary. But he's a gentle giant. So guys will go up and they'll ask Al a question and they'll leave with ways to solve that problem and be better for it. What I understand leading the organization is how critical Al is to our overall success. Period. To the point to where when I became iKeepers president, I took Al to Applebee's, you ask him. This is, I took Al to Applebee's and said, Al, we need to have lunch. Al said, after, Al was right after Mark. I mean, this is critical now, people that share knowledge that are valuable. I said, Al, you gonna stay with this, this thing we got going on? He was like, mm. You know, he didn't even, he just was like, because he didn't really realize that I viewed him like that till that moment. He was like, mm. I mean, I guess. I said, Al, are you going to tell me if I'm not doing a good job? If you think I'm about to run this trade? He's like, hmm, yeah, I'll tell you. I said, and then look, and I looked at his man's word. I said, you promise? He said, I promise. And then I was good to go. Because he is a sheer and distributor of knowledge that is very, very unique, but he doesn't keep it to himself. So here's teams. And then we'll, we'll wind it down. <clears throat> Another critical thing that, in, in my opinion, is who you surround yourself with. One of the things that I'm working on very carefully with my kids, and it was done for me with, with my parents. I mean, my parents were perfect people, but they did some, some good things, some very good things with me and my sister. But one of the things that was critical is my, my dad sitting down with me and talking to me about choosing friends. And talking to me about, and, and in the college environment and, and college sports, and, and this isn't NC State, this is just big time college athletics, right? I mean, it is a business, right? Even though it exists on a university. I mean, sorry, but it, it is a business, right? And so therefore, if the business isn't producing certain results, people that were your friend, taking you to dinner, aren't anymore, and they'll fire you just like a business or they'll tell you things that aren't quite true to get you to participate in their business. Okay, fine. But at an early age, I was exposed to this in some of these conversations, and it didn't make me disgruntled with the goodness of people. What it made me realize is that under pressure, good people can make bad decisions, all of us. In choosing your friends, you want to choose friends, peers, mentors that make significantly more good decisions than bad ones. So you need to evaluate who you're running with because that's going to be a major contributor to how far you rise professionally and personally. A major contributor. If you look at rock star teams in technology, right? You think of Bill Gates and you think of what's his uh, bomber, right? They, 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 what's the guy, Sergey, Serge, what's the, who are the Google guys? Larry and Serge, they did pretty good, didn't they? Right? How would they, uh, separate? I don't know, because when you think about Google, don't you think about them as a pair? Kind of running together? And think about the amount of time they spent with each other and their small core team versus other people that weren't going after that similar thing. Right? So it's very important to choose people that are passionate about something that's positive to spend that time and run with, that can sharpen you technically, people skills wise, whatever it is that you need. The challenge is when we get older, we think that doesn't apply. It actually matters a whole lot more. And what I found, and I've been very, very fortunate, is I've got a, everybody's on Facebook, right? Some of y'all are on Facebook now. I see y'all. <laughs> he looked up guilty. <laughs> guilty. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Tell him how awesome this is. But anyway. Facebook friend. I mean, I like Facebook. Right? I mean, I like Facebook. But I don't have 250 friends. I mean, I don't. I mean, you might, I don't. Right? I got a buddy of mine, and he is, he's a good friend. But he called up and he said, man, I got 500 friends on Facebook. You know Carl Astor, right? I said, no, you don't. 
He's like, I do too. Look and see. I was like, no, you don't. He said, yes, I do. And he's like, some of my friends are large. So he's like six foot six, former NFL player, play ball in the ECU. He said, yes, I do. I was like, look, man, we have this argument all you want, but you do not. He was like, it says. I was like, how many of them 500 people at 2 o'clock in the morning you can call, they're going to come get you no matter where you are? Oh, yeah, I got like 10 friends. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's. But whoever that core is, remember this. Figure out how you can add value to your friends and how they can add value to you. Right? It's not a technology thing, it's a, it's a people thing. Film study, as I wrap up, think about your successes, failures. What are the differences that you can learn from each? This is how I think about I cubed. Talented individuals flying in tight formation. We're doing it together. And we're chasing big goals, which makes it fun. I, I would encourage you guys to find a place. If you work at one already, that's fantastic. I applaud you. Who are the folks with Fidelity that sponsored the, the thing? Raise your hand real quick. First of all, thank you. Not only for the conference, but you guys manage our money, our 401k, and all that good stuff. So, hey, look, keep doing what y'all doing. <laughs> you know, my 401k is actually back up. I stayed aggressive in the downturn. <laughs> right? So, thank you, Fidelity. You know, keep everything locked down and tight. But the closing thought that, that I would tell you guys is decide what you want bad enough that you're willing to go the extra mile to be different, to be unique. Because the competition now in the technology space, which is why we love it, right? I mean, it is, it is a very competitive environment, right? And I, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I, from an athletic background and from, I mean, and, you know, the academic, uh, the computer science department, I mean, they're, they're preparing people to compete in one of the most competitive fields in the planet. That's cool. Right? When I talk to Ken and we're talking about things we're doing with the students and the EPAR and the passion for the, and I go to the strategic advisory board meeting and I'm listening to professors talk and I'm listening to them lay out the, the curriculum, we're adding suggestions. The passion for what they're trying to do and accomplish for the students is phenomenal. It is contagious. You need to find an organization professionally that gives you that same kind of, that same kind of oomph or you need to figure out how to create your own. Right, either way, but you'll go further, faster, and stay steady longer if you're chasing something that you're passionate about. Last thing, and then I'm done. We'll take maybe one question, but I think I'm over time. Um, and I remember this from my networking days, network marketing days. But this has stayed with me big time. Three types of people in the world. You got to know the distinct difference of these folks. People that can hurt you, people that can help you, and people that don't make any difference. And you can never confuse the three. People that can hurt you, don't antagonize them. Keep your distance. People that can help you, stay close to them, learn all you can. Be a sponge. People that have knowledge to share like to share it. Become a good listener and good note taker. Grant's no different than my dad. My racquetball buddy's no different than Grant. Guys and gals, but guys in particular. Guys and gals, but guys in particular that are good at something want to tell you how they did it. They do not want to keep that junk a secret. Like, they, they, they don't. Hey, listen, man, how did you hit that shot on me? Well, what, what I did was, you know, you was over here, and, and your feet were wrong, so I just put the ball over here. That's, that's how I did it. And I was like, really? Well, how did you do that lob thing? Well, what you got to do is you got to stand like this. You know, like you're catching the bat. And I would get a whole seminar after the game. I'd ask Grant, I'd just say, how did you start IQ? What did you do? What different situations? And you know what he would do? He would tell me. You know what I mean? I wrote it down. The stuff I didn't agree with, I put it on the table. The stuff I agreed with has helped me make a lot of money. I don't have a lot of great ideas. I just know where to get them. Listen to people that want to tell me them. I mean, it's like ridiculous. Succeeding ain't that hard. Unless you think you have to do it all by yourself. If you think you got to do it all by yourself, good luck with that.
We're going to keep the team thing going, and uh, I enjoyed it. Thanks a bunch.